starts right now. And we begin with a late breaking shooting in southeast Bear County. Sheriff's deputies responding to the 9600 block of Hildebrandt Road for reports of multiple shooting victims. When they arrived, they found a man and a woman with gunshot wounds. They were both transported to the hospital. It is unclear at this time who shot them or what led to this incident. We'll continue to update this story online as details become available. A horror they never imagined. The family of Renee Rodriguez says they've been left broken. Rodriguez was shot and killed earlier this week. The person arrested for his murder, his 13-year-old sister and her 13-year-old boyfriend. The night team, Stephen Cavazos, with the family struggle to move forward. It's not normal. This is not a normal feeling. How can we wake up from this nightmare? A nightmare. That's how Michelle Gutierrez describes the loss of her son, 20-year-old Rene Rodriguez Jr. He was killed in their home off Masses Boulevard early Wednesday morning. San Antonio police say Rene was in his bed when he was shot four times. Police say a 13-year-old boy allegedly pulled the trigger. The family believe he was let in the house by Rene's 13-year-old sister. Rene, lo Rene loved my sister. That was the baby of the house. Raquel Rodriguez says the two teens had been in a relationship for almost a year, but the family did not approve. SAPD says the pair was last seen leaving the home after the shooting. On Thursday, they were both arrested and charged with Renee's murder. Raquel says the family is broken. I love you. I just cannot forgive you on this. I cannot. Renee was described as a doting son and a caring brother to his siblings. His younger brother, Ruben, says they shared a special bond. All I cared about is my brother. But he says the tragedy took away everything. I feel like I'm alone in the house. Michelle is still not ready to let her son go, but believes in a chance of forgiveness and hope their family can one day come back together. I will stand by my daughter to protect her, to teach her that this isn't the end. Stephen Cavasso's KSAT 12 News. New on the night beat, San Antonio police piecing together a shooting at a north side apartment complex. Police responded to a call for gun fire around seven tonight at a complex on the 9500 block of Contessa Drive near Highway 281 and Loop 410. Police tell us that one person, a woman, received minor injuries related to gunfire but was not transported to a hospital for care. Officers say that the gunfire came from a nearby apartment. Two people, a man and a woman, were detained. Another nearby apartment was also affected by gunfire, but no one inside was hurt. No word yet on any charges. I'll take a look at your screen here. Have you seen this woman and child? San Antonio police are looking for them. They say the young girl was last seen in the 2900 block of West Commerce. She's to, believed to be in the company of 21-year-old Kimberly Mata, who is also missing. If you have information which could help police find them, you're asked to call SAPD's Missing Persons Unit at 210-207-7660. Food deserts are prevalent on the south side. Add the pandemic, job loss. They add more stress to families already struggling to find fresh produce near their home. As the night team's Tiffany Huertas reports, Southside ISD and the San Antonio Food Bank play critical roles, ensuring that no one goes hungry. If it wasn't for the food drives here, I wouldn't have enough to feed all six and myself. Mary Castillo is the sole provider for her six grandchildren. Southside ISD's food distributions ensure there's food on their table. They give rice and a uh, bag of beans, canned foods, a lot of tuna, corn, a lot of vegetables too. Twice a month, the district hosts food distributions. They feed more than 5,000 people a month. It's a service that is open to everyone, not just those with children in the district. The need is always great because we're in a rural community. A lot of our recipients of the food are elderly. They don't have means or the resources to drive into San Antonio or Pleasanton to uh, obtain food. Gloria Mendoza and her four grandchildren also benefit from the food distributions. The food helped me a lot. There are no supermarkets. We have to go 15 to 20 minutes to go to HEB or Walmart. There's probably more distributions on the south side 
than any other part just to try to meet the demands of that population. The San Antonio Food Bank works with Southside ISD to make the distributions happen. The nonprofit says one in four children experience hunger in San Antonio. It's very difficult for a child to to focus and learn when they're hungry. The majority of the food the nonprofit distributes come from donors like HEB. But the food bank also has farms where they grow produce. All the produce that we grow both here at the San Antonio Food Bank and what we grow at Mission San Juan is integrated into our distributions out to our partner pantries and our programs. The Mission San Juan Farm is a partnership with the National Park Service. Dozens of acres of land is used to help feed people. The food bank says on average 75,000 pounds of produce per year come from the farm. Every pound with a goal to provide access to fresh food to communities in need. Tiffany Huertas, KSAT 12 News. Well, turning now to the latest COVID-19 numbers in Bear County, city and county officials announcing 191 new cases today and no new deaths. In addition, we learned 193 patients are hospitalized locally with 84 in the ICU and 37 on ventilators. Well, with just 25 days until Election Day, President Trump is vowing to get back on the campaign trail. But the president now admitting he wasn't in great shape before. The president insists he feels perfect, but also admitted to radio show host Rush Limbaugh he was very sick last week. White House phys physician Dr. Sean Conley revealed few details about the president's condition, but says the president is clear to resume his public schedule as soon as Saturday. Conley has previously made false statements about the president's treatment, and White House aides are still refusing to answer when the president last tested negative for COVID-19, a crucial detail for contact tracing. Um, I can't reveal that at this time. The doctors would like to keep it private. Sources tell ABC News President Trump will host an in-person event at the White House tomorrow, even though it is still considered a hot spot for COVID-19. The president is expected to discuss law and order and will reportedly address the crowd from the White House balcony. Coming up on the night beat, what does it take to fly straight into a hurricane and why do we do it? Meteorologist Justin Horn met up with the hurricane hunters before they flew off into the eye of Delta today. We have a closer look at their thrilling work coming up next. Hurricane Delta is one of a record number of named storms to strike the United States in 2020. It's been a busy year all the way round, including for those forecasting those storms. An integral part of forecasting tropical weather is flying into it. The 53rd Weather Reconnaissance Squadron of the U.S. Air Force or Hurricane Hunters have been pretty busy. In fact, they've been using JBSA Lackland for their missions into Hurricane Delta. Justin Horn was there today as the crew prepared to fly into the storm again. 2020 has been hectic. The Hurricane Hunters have been busy. The tempo. Uh, just constant uh, multiple storms at one time going to different locations and flying storms uh, in, in the Gulf and the Atlantic and Pacific simultaneously. This is what they do and it's vitally important. The main mission is to get to the center of the storm. From there they collect various data from inside their C-130 aircraft, measuring things like wind speeds using instruments called drop sons. It's kind of like taking an x-ray of the storm. Out over the water there's, there's nothing that can accurately measure in real time. That data going into models to help better predict these tropical systems and potentially save lives. This is the cockpit of the C-130. So far, they've flown about five missions here from San Antonio into Hurricane Delta. Had we stayed back uh, in Biloxi, it's possible that the weather would not have permitted us to continue running 24-hour storm operations. Kiesler Air Force Base in Biloxi is their home base, but they've had to relocate several times this year, using Joint Base San Antonio Lackland on three occasions for Sally Beta and now Delta. Delta's been a little bit tricky. Um, it hasn't been quite as organized in a, in a textbook case the entire time. So what storm has been the most impressive? Uh, this season, I think Laura, for me personally, uh, was the most memorable. Uh, just 
uh, an incredible storm as far as intensity. And the season's not over yet, which means more missions may be ahead. Justin Horn, KSAT 12 News. All right, taking a live look outside with live cam. It is 77 degrees, nothing like what the hurricane hunters have to experience. And a big, a big shout out to the hurricane hunters yeah. who are in town right now, hopefully taking a break and getting a rest now that the storm has made landfall and a big thank you to them. And even one of our KSAT viewers, Bill Sims is a former hurricane hunter. He lives up in Kerrville. He's retired and it is, I can't even emphasize enough how important the data is that they collect. You can do only so much with remote sensing, you know, satellites and all other tools that look into these storms. You really have to physically get into them to measure them accurately and so flying through them is the best way to do it. All right, let's take a look at the satellite and radar and you see over most of Texas really not much activity far east Texas right along the state line with Louisiana. That's where we have some heavy rain from Delta made landfall shortly after 6 p.m. as a category two hurricane near Creole. Louisiana right now it's a cat one winds of 75 miles per hour. Some gusts potentially up to 100 central pressure now at 972 millibars moving to the north northeast at 15. At least this is a progressive storm kind of like Laura. Now Laura was stronger and unfortunately it hit the same part of Louisiana, but at least they're moving. Unlike go back what three years ago, Harvey that just sat in one spot and didn't move and we saw what happened with that. It just makes the situ situation worse. So at least if there's a silver lining, these storms are moving and they're progressive, dumping a lot of heavy rainfall. Of course, I've checked some observations over the past 36 hours, over five to nine inches in some parts of Louisiana. Taking a look at our wind gusts, the most recent ones, you see a wide range. You see some 60 mile per hour gusts, but a lot of these sites aren't actually reporting right now. And I would mostly attribute that to power outages or communication outages rather than the actual anemometers being uh, broken or knocked offline. I just don't think we're getting the actual readings from them, just the communication errors. But uh, the winds associated with it right now around the center are at about 75 miles per hour, especially the north end of that eye. More rain, but it's all spreading north and then eastward. So it's moving away from Texas. I wish we could get some of the leftovers of this and have a few inches of rain, but unfortunately that's not in the works here. So I mentioned Laura. Let's compare Delta to Laura. They their paths were very similar from the Caribbean into the Gulf of Mexico, and then they basically intersected right where they made landfall just south of Lake Charles, Louisiana. Of course, Laura was a cat four slammed Lake Charles. Unfortunately, a lot of places, buildings and structures have not fully been repaired and people haven't been able to recover yet from Laura. Then they get Delta on top of it. Unfortunately, 71 this morning as well above our average of 62, 92 this afternoon, and that was just two degrees shy of the record this weekend. I think some records will fall. I really do 77 out there right now and a dew point is 67. It's muggy and not much of a breeze. So we have that humidity and it's the time of year in the fall where we have longer nights as well. So I am anticipating some fog, high humidity, longer nights, clear sky, no wind. It's pointing towards some patchy fog in the morning. Castroville 77 comfort right now at 66 and Canyon Lake at 75. Still 80 though in Catula. Let's fast forward to tomorrow morning. Widespread 60s to start the day. Low to mid 60s, closer to the Rio Grande, upper 60s locally by the afternoon. We'll be well into the 90s and even triple digits southwest of town. Catula, Laredo, Del Rio, 100 degrees tomorrow. And I think by Sunday we'll be breaking a record here in San Antonio, making it up to 98. And I would, wouldn't even be surprised if we hit 100 on Sunday. So very summer like this weekend, record challenging heat. And then next week we trim back just a little bit. All right, thank you, Adam. All right, and Greg Simmons is back in the studio after being out there on the road for big game coverage at Rutledge Stadium. Now we're talking about a tough season opener. That, this for Wagner. This one had to go to overtime to decide against undefeated Smithson Valley. When we come back, we'll show you how this game went down and can the Rockets rebound from their season opening loss. They're in New Braunfels tonight. Coming up. Big game coverage on KSAT 12.
All right, the big game and a big game covers is the undefeated and six-ranked Smithson Valley Rangers facing the Wagner Thunderbirds. This is the Thunderbirds season opener, district opener at the same time. The Rangers are 3-0. and Wagner answers. Isaiah Williams on the quarterback keeper goes right up the middle on the five yard score. They go for two and get it. Eight to three Thunderbirds. Rangers cough it up deep in their own territory. The ball slips out of the quarterback's hand. It's ruled a fumble. Alex Bolden falls on the ball. Wagner takes over in a great position. LJ Butler, who returned to Wagner after flirting with Judson, makes the Rangers pay. Butler finds the end zone. 15 to three Wagner at the break. Second half. Rangers on the attack. New quarterback in for the Rangers. Jacob Cernahaus with the quick pass. It is almost tipped, but the Maverick Freeland there snags it and scores from four yards out as a five-point game. The Rangers aren't done. This time on the ground, Gabe Hoskins makes his way through the Wagner defense, finds the end zone for the 16 yards away. They go for two, and they get it. Smith Valley takes the lead 18-50. Now the Rangers leading 21-15 when Wagner strikes again. Quarterback Isaiah Williams finds Matthew Sam, goes for it, and it's, he's got it. Look at this. Great catch. It's now 21-all. If they make the extra point, they take the lead, but it's partially blocked, and we're tied at 21-all. We're headed to overtime. Rangers have to settle for a field goal. They're up 24-21, but LJ Butler is able to score at the goal line. Wagner pulls it out in overtime 27 24. I'm just very, very excited. We fought through four hard quarters, never gave up. Just proud of all, all glory goes to my old line. We just stay true to what we do. We just we smash my football team, get the ball, run it down their throat. And it was working for us, so we kept doing it. All right, let's head up to Unicorn Stadium. Third rank, Judson Rockets taking on defeated New Braunfels in the district opener 27-6 after losing to DeSoto last week, 37-0. Justin up 10-0 early in the third quarter. DeAnthony Lewis gets a handoff at midfield, hits the hole, races off. 50-yard touchdown run, puts the Rockets up by 17 to nothing. He's, he somersaults his way to the end zone. The final from Unicorn Stadium is New Braunfels Falls, 37-14. Check out this cool slow motion shot from our photographer, Billy Caldera, the East Central Hornets, taking the field against Steele. Knights on the attack midway through the first quarter. And Marian Contreras gets it on the jet sweep to the near sideline, coming right at you. He's tackled at the seven-yard line. They're a gain of 19. A few plays later, Michael Boyton takes a handoff, outruns the defense, dies for the pylon. He is in for the seven-yard score, seven I think lead the final from the district 27 6 8 contest is East Central Falls to steal 24 to 6. Let's head to Dragon Stadium. Southwest taking on Layman. Non district game, second quarter. Dragons up 13 to 10, going for it on fourth and goal at the three. Nathan Gomez hits Trey Cano for the touchdown. Extra point good. Southwest takes the lead 20 to 10. Let's head to the big game coverage scoreboard for the first time tonight for that final. And as you can see, it is Southwest over, I should say, Layman over Southwest 26 to 20. Wagner Downing Smithson Valley 27 and 24. Elsewhere, Judson and New Braunfels just with a big win, 37-14, and steal over East Central, 24-6. It's Hawaiian night over at Hero Stadium. Fourth-ranked Brandeis taking on MacArthur. Remember, this is a district game after the Broncos are relocated to 28-6A. Second quarter, game tied at 7. Broncos ball, Nico Garcia dances around in the pocket, eludes the rush, then fires downfield for Julian Izagari. He's got it. That's a gain of 22 yards down to the 20-yard line a few plays later. They punch it in. Garcia keeps it himself, walks in for the three-yard score. Great blocking by the offensive line. The final from Heroes is... MacArthur Falls 35 to 7. The Johnson Jaguars taking on Leah Comalander Stadium. Showdown District 28-6A. Jaguars bite first. Ty Reasoner with a quick pass to Matthew Rodriguez, who makes a nice move to get all the way down to the three-yard line. A pickup of 21 yards. Two plays later, Rodriguez is the man in motion, takes a handoff this time, gets it to the outside, in for the first touchdown of the game. Jaguars go up 7-0. The final from Comalander Stadium. Johnson with a big win, 42 to 7. The Marshall Rams wield into battle axe as they take the field of Ferris Stadium for the second half of their game against O'Connor. Rams down 24-14. Dylan Cooper dumps it off on a screen pass to Josiah Garcia. Watch this run. He finds the scene, races to the end zone, but the ball pops out at the one-yard line. It rolls into the end zone. The Rams recover it there for the 42-yard touchdown. Extra point, no good, so it's still 24-20. O'Connor, can the Rams pull off the upset? And the answer is... They do, 36-33. Harlan Hawks in 6A now, and they are already in the middle of district play in 29-6A against Taftam at Gustafson Stadium. Jaden Williams comes up with a big hit on this play, knocking the ball loose, and Josu, uh, Josu Hernandez jumps on it, and that's a fumble tap ball. Third and goal now from the five. Now for tap, Diego Martinez takes a pitch. He's able to get into the end zone. Fumbles the ball two, but it looks like he'd already crossed the goal line. For that matter, his teammate recovers. Seven nothing tap. Let's head back to the big game cover scoreboard for that final as well. Tap gets a big win, 28 to seven. It was Marshall of O'Connor, 36 to 33. Elsewhere in this. 
battle between Brandeis and MacArthur, 35 to 7. The Broncos with the win, and Johnson over Lee, 42 to 7. Bernie Greyhounds in a District 14-4A Division One showdown with the Pleasant and Eagles tonight. Already up 2 nothing following the safety. The Greyhounds attack again. Rashawn Galloway running on the option pitches it to J.P. Castro, who breaks a tackle and gets inside the Pleasant and 10. Few plays later, Kobe Hunter is in going to score the short touchdown. They go for two. They get it now. Lead 10 nothing. Let's check the final from Bernie now. The Greyhounds get the win, 45 to 20. Message from Cardinal fans at Southside tonight for the Somerset Bulldogs, and they sure did. Already up 33 to nothing. Matthew Castaneda and Nicola Hernandez team up to bring down the Bulldogs quarterback that appears to be in the end zone for safety, but it's ruled just outside the end zone. The final from Southside. The Cardinals get the big shutout, 33 to nothing. St. Anthony Cheerleaders welcome us to Benson Stadium at UIW. Yellow Jackets taking on St. John Paul II out of Corpus Christi. St. Anthony in the red zone going for it on fourth and 10. Juan Sierra keeps it himself, but he's tackled at the eight yard line. Turnover and downs, and JP2 takes advantage. Ensuing drive, Oscar Ozuna takes it in himself right up the middle, breaks a pair of tackles, powers his way for the 15 yard score. They go for two, convert to go up 14 to nine. They had to call the game early to do a blown fuse on a light stand. The final from UIW Stadium is 35 to nine. Corpus Christi, St. John Paul II. And Tony and cheerleaders have a lot to yell about tonight. The Apaches were already up by 39 in the fourth, and they would add to it. Javante Johnson takes the ball, starts up the middle, then cuts to the outside, picks up 30 yards to get inside the 10 of the Lions. Cole Zay on the play action pass. As a result, finds Eric Diaz, who sheds two blockers, gets by, and is able to score 49 to 3. Antonian. Take a look at these finals now for you. Antonio over sacks. 49 to 10. It was St. Anthony falling tonight, 35 to 9 in their home game over at UIW. Bernie over Pleasanton, 45 to 20. A shutout for Southside over Somerset, 33 to nothing. We have much more to come, including our big game coverage road trip, fan cam, and more highlights and more scores. But first, let's listen to the Stockdale Brahma marching band. Big game coverage road trip as photographer Eddie Latigo out in the country with scheduled stops in Lavernia, Stockdale, Nixon, Smiley. But we had to add Navarro out on an audible. <laughs> You'll find out why. Let's take it live in the newsroom for all the highlights. And that's where we find our Larry Ramirez. Hey, Larry. Thanks, Greg. We'll have that update for you in just a minute. Lavernia is off to a nice start this season of 4-2, and two, entering their district opener tonight with Uvalde. The Coyotes were looking to snap a five-game slide. Lavernia Bears charging their home turf ahead of their District 14 4 a one matchup with Uvalde. And it doesn't take long for the Bears to get on the board. First quarter, quarterback Gage Lowry hands off to Sebastian Sanchez. He gets good blocking and he's thinking end zone, but he gets knocked out of bounds at the one after a 44 yard gain. Moments later, you can sound that touchdown horn because Sebastian Sanchez scores from one yard out and Lavernia leads seven to nothing. Natalia and Nixon Smiley, District 15 3 a two in the Battle of Mustangs, third quarter. Natalia ball quarterback Jacob Navarro throws a little screen pass to Adrian Vasquez. The O-line gives him plenty of room to make some moves. He switches the ball to his left hand and he is gone for a 74 yard touchdown. Easy peasy two point conversion was good and Natalia goes up 28 14 Vasquez with 279 total yards and four touchdowns. Take you to tomorrow now for some District 14 for a two action with Austin Eastside Memorial. The Battle of Panthers through a quarter Navarro ball quarterback Nick Billings rolls out then lobs a pass to wide open Hunter Monroe 37 yard touchdown and Navarro goes up 84 nothing late in the third quarter. Let's go to that scoreboard now. So Lavernia wins 49 to nothing. Stockdale and Carn City has been postponed till early November and moving on to the rest of the scoreboard you have uh, Navarro winning easily 94 nothing and Natalia is victorious as well 43 21 and just as a reminder so Carn City versus Stockdale has moved to Friday November 6 not sure why the game still at Stockdale Greg back to you. Thanks a lot Larry time now for fan cam where you are fans help us cover one of the big games in our big game covers tonight here's our Andrew Seeley. Great atmosphere tonight as Holy Cross looks for their second win of the season against Shiner St. Paul, and they strike first. Opening drive, quarterback Jordan Battles keeps it himself, cuts back against the grain, hurdles the man, and is he going out of bounds? Nope. Racing down the sideline with only one man to beat, and he fakes him out to get to the pylon. How's that for a highlight? 53-yard touchdown gives the Knights a 7-0 lead. But the Cardinals respond a few plays later. Kay Geese looks like he's going to throw, then decides to pull it down and knifes his way through the defense for the 42-yard 
yard score. That ties it up at seven. And that's the score at the end of the first quarter. Both teams still tied at seven. From Wheatley Heights Sports Complex, Andrew Seeley, KSAT 12 Sports. Thanks a lot, Andrew. Let's take a look at your final. Holy Cross gets the win, 21 to 14. Wimberley with a big shutout tonight, 88 to nothing. Elsewhere, as we continue along, is uh, Harker Heights over Champion. That's their first loss, 20 to 14. They'll be knocked out of number one in 12's top 12. Alamo Heights on the road today, big win on the road, 27 to 20 over Buta Johnson. Elsewhere tonight, Post stays undefeated in number one in 12's top 12. Sub five, they pull 49 to 10. Lano hands comfort their first loss of the season, 49 to 17. Elsewhere tonight in our big game coverage scoreboard, Jordan over Cole, 51 to nothing. Randolph falls to Lytle tonight, 21 to 20, but that game went into overtime, as you can see. Marion with the win over Catula, 41 to 34. Cornerstone down in Legacy Christian Academy, 44 to 7. Elsewhere, of course, you saw the score on Navarro, 94 to nothing. Big win there. And Colleen Shoemaker over Kerrville Tivy, 56 35. If you have to miss anything, no problem. Just go to biggamecoverage.com later tonight. You can see all the highlights and the final scores. Definitely exciting stuff. Thank you, Greg. Yeah. We'll be right back. How and where to school your children. It's a hot topic amid the coronavirus pandemic, as many parents are facing tough decisions when it comes to their kids' education. Today, during our KSAT Q&A segment, which was recorded during the 6 o'clock news, we spoke with a representative from San Antonio Charter Moms who shared some advice for both students and parents. Take a look. With our COVID-19 numbers continuing to head in an encouraging direction and the positivity rate now finally below that 5% goal, a lot of students might be headed back to class, back to campuses the first time in months. Yeah. So part of our KSAT Q&A today, Inga Cotton, founder and executive director of San Antonio Charter Moms. Thanks for being with us. I uh, want to talk to you first about your biggest recommendations for kids and families who are making that decision to finally head back to the classroom. What are the biggest ways they can prepare? Yeah, so it's decision time because a lot of uh, schools, depending on their calendar, maybe first quarter is ending or there's a new grading period starting. And that's an opportunity when families can choose to have their kids go back on campus. Um, but it's important to do your research. Um, you know, kids need to know that when they go back on campus, it's not going to be the same as it was back in early March. There might be fewer kids in their classroom. There might be shields on their desks. They might have to wear masks. There's going to be more hand washing stations. So we encourage every family to research what the new procedures are on campus and then spend some time talking to your kids ahead of time um, just so that they know what to expect and they're not disappointed. You know, maybe they can't play the same way at recess as they used to. And we know that all parents aren't ready to send their kids back into the classroom. So distance learning is continuing in a lot of situations. Talk about how important it is to find that balance between independence and supervision. Yeah, you know, it depends a lot on the kids' ages. So like my friends who have very young children, sometimes they really have to sit side by side with them and make sure that they're able to use that technology and get stuff turned in and stay on task. But what I encourage families is like, as your kids get older and even surprisingly young kids can, can learn these technology skills. They can learn to check, you know, what's their to-do list today, make sure they get stuff turned in. But it's always good to have that, that safety net of, you know, going in at the end of the day, make sure stuff gets turned in, you know, maybe every week go in and check the grades and just make sure that, that things are on track and have those open lines of communication with the teachers because we need to give lots of love and care to the teachers. They're working very hard, but they're, you know, they're, they care deeply about the students and they want to help us. And they want to answer our questions. And you know, a lot of this happening while parents are balancing their own jobs at home, working from home on top of this. So whatever decision families have made about their child's education, not an easy one, right? During this entire pandemic. So what would you uh, tell parents to watch for no matter how their child is learning in terms of red flags? How could a parent tell, okay, the current situation is not working for my child. Yeah, this, this is something that comes up a lot in our, um, so we have a discussion group on Facebook. It's open to people in the San Antonio community, moms, dads, gr guardians, grandparents. Um, and, you know, some of these people will message me or one of the admins and say, I have this anonymous question, I'm concerned. And, and then we'll, we'll share it for them and, and get feedback. And so it might be something more subtle, it might not be just that they're not turning stuff in or they're, the grades are low. It might be something more like, they just seem to want to lie down all the time. Um, they seem to be losing interest in the things that they used to like. Um, they talk about how much they miss their friends. 
you know, so those might be signs that maybe the isolation is getting to be a problem. And we've shared resources on our website about things like mindfulness and mental health and how to take breaks and, you know, just the, the ways to cope as best you can with, you know, for those adults who are working remotely and for kids who are doing remote education, you know, but it's important to, you know, look at the big picture and say, are we making the right trade-off or does my kid need to be with a teacher? Do they need to be with kids their own age that they can play with and socialize with? And Ingo, all of this can be stressful just to try to take it all in. How important it is, is it for you to find time for wellness, doing things like outdoor activities, stepping away from the computer screen, not being in front of it all day? Just talk about that. Yeah, that's, that's really important. I think there's, there's this myth of productivity that, you know, just the more minutes you spend at the computer, then you're winning. But that's not true. It's really better to take breaks and then come back to the computer more productive. Right? It's better for your health. So, um, you know, having like a set of stretches that you do or maybe like a few simple yoga poses um, that kind of resets your body, um, taking a moment of mindfulness where you're, you're thinking about how you feel, but not judging how you feel, right? Maybe if you feel a little sluggish, it's because these are really tough circumstances that we're all living in. Um, you know, and then think of, ask yourself how you feel, ask your kids how they feel, and then think, how, how would I rather feel in this moment that our feelings are not, it's not something external that's being pushed on us. It's something that we have control over inside, but it's a skill that takes that takes practice. So just, you know, understand that productivity means having balance, right? So you work when you're at your best and then you take a break and, and refresh yourself. And going outside is fantastic. My family, we've loved the, the Greenway Trail system here in San Antonio and the Texas State Park system. And those have really been our escape and our, our refuge. And a lot of people have needed that over these last seven months. Before we go, mm -hmm. uh, tell people how they can be part of those Facebook groups or the other online groups. How can they find uh, that resource? Yeah, so San Antonio Charter Moms is a nonprofit organization and uh, it's free to join the Facebook group. So it's the San Antonio Charter Moms discussion group on Facebook. And uh, we have a website with free resources, how to research schools. So we want families to find schools that are the right fit, whether it's a charter school, private school, magnet school, traditional public school, homeschooling, pandemic pod, you name it. And so, you know, it just, it, the focus is on education and it's meant to be a welcoming and supportive group where you can, you can say, hey, this is what I'm concerned about. And it's parents helping parents to problem solve because that's what we all need right now is a little extra help. And again, not just for parents of students who are in charter schools, for any parent who's looking right. for to just to bounce ideas off of each other. Yeah, all yeah, right. come, come join us, we welcome you. All right, Inga Cotton joining us from San Antonio Charter Moms, giving us some really good advice as the semesters continue. Thank you very much, Inga. Thank you so much. Good evening. We'll be right back. Hurricane Delta crashing into the Gulf Coast today, hitting the same areas still recovering from Hurricane Laura just six weeks ago. Delta is the 25th named storm of an unprecedented Atlantic hurricane season. ABC's Elwin Lopez reports from Lafayette, Louisiana. Hurricane Delta made a record-breaking landfall in southwest Louisiana, packing 100-mile-per-hour winds sparking power outages in Lake Charles. That area already hard hit by Hurricane Laura just six weeks ago. I drive around and see all this debris and it's pretty rough. After tonight, tomorrow, that stuff gonna be blown all over the place again. Thousands of homes there still damaged, covered in tarps. Now Delta pummeling Welsh, Louisiana with heavy rain. And in Crystal Beach, Texas, strong wind gusts peeling off this protective metal shed. The fast moving storm is bringing flash flooding far inland. Millions of people from Texas to Mississippi keeping an eye on what it will do next. It is very clear that Southwest Louisiana is gonna get more of a punch from this than we would like to see. Tonight, Louisiana, Mississippi, and Alabama all under a state of emergency. You, you just hope for the best and prepare for the worst. There's gonna be some worry no matter what, but we've been through it before. We just take it one thing at a time. In parts of Louisiana, we could see up to 11 feet of life-threatening storm surge before this storm moves out of here and into the Northeast. Ellen Lopez, ABC News, Lafayette, Louisiana. 
Elsewhere around America, Sean Fix, one of the 13 men accused in an alleged plot against Michigan Governor Gretchen Whitmer, faced a judge via Zoom today on state firearms and terrorist act charges. Seven men in total are facing criminal charges under Michigan's Anti-Terrorism Act. Six other suspects are facing federal charges of conspiracy to kidnap. This is a highly dangerous group. They were well armed. They were training. They had a plan. Authorities claim their goal was to kidnap Governor Whitmer before Election Day and to also allegedly bomb the state Capitol building and attack law enforcement in an effort to violently overthrow state governments they felt were violating the U.S. Constitution. Prosecutors say they even discussed with undercover agents the idea of putting Whitmer on trial and executing her. Earlier this week, the Department of Homeland Security said the U.S. has seen an increase in anti-government and anarchist violent extremism, adding white supremacists are the biggest domestic threat the nation is currently facing. The Roman Catholic Diocese of Brooklyn is suing New York State over new restrictions concerning religious gatherings. Earlier this week, Governor Cuomo said that the precautions that had been in place were not enough. Under the new enforcement effort in New York communities in known COVID clusters or red zones, houses of worship can only operate at 25% capacity with a maximum of 10 people inside. Now in orange zones, houses of worship can function at 33% capacity with a maximum of 25 people inside. In the lawsuit, the diocese is seeking an injunction preventing the enforcement of the attendance limits in red and orange zones. We believe that our rights now are being infringed, especially First Amendment rights for worship, uh, in an unfair way. Bishop DiMarzio says the diocese will comply with all of the latest guidelines, but he hopes to receive a response to the lawsuit in the coming weeks. Four Black Lives Matter demonstrators have filed a civil rights lawsuit in the aftermath of a deadly protest last month in Kenosha, Wisconsin. They're suing Kyle Rittenhouse, two self-styled militia groups, and Facebook. Rittenhouse is the teenager accused of traveling to Kenosha on August 25th and killing two protesters. The lawsuit says Rittenhouse acted under the supervision of a member of the Boogaloo Boys extreme, extremist group. The plaintiffs say Facebook allowed this group and the Kenosha Guard to organize their violent acts on the social media platform even after more than 400 complaints. Facebook says it took down Rittenhouse's page and took action against those groups. The University of North Carolina, Asheville, placed under a shelter-in-place order today. Several of its offices received an email threat overnight demanding a Black Lives Matter mural be painted over. While details of the threat have not been made public, university staff deemed it necessary to cancel classes and campus activities for the day. Residents were told to stay where they were and all non-essential staff was directed to stay home. Barricades were used to block entrances to campuses to the campus. The shelter in place is in effect at least until tomorrow morning. The threat still under investigation. Take one last look at live cam this evening. A very pleasant 77 degrees out there on the weekend. Just a few minutes away. What more can you ask yes. for? And it's going to be summery. Well, so someone asked for a cold front. <laughs> uh, <laughs> We're not just, getting that. Just saying, just saying. I know uh, some folks who would be asking for that, but it's we're going to have a taste of summer as we go through this weekend and really the next several days. We're humming well above average and in record breaking territory this weekend. The aquifer actually up a little bit today. It can fluctuate upward, especially this time of year when we're not pumping as much. It's up three tenths of a foot today, but we're still about three feet below the October average. Ragweed, moderate, mold and pigweed, both low. All right, let's talk about the latest with the hurricane. You can see it now on shore and it made landfall officially at around 6 p.m. near Creole, Louisiana moving northward and it continues its trek with heavy rainfall and some pockets of very high gusts as well and high winds. Now a category one. So luckily it did dissipate or weaken, I should say a little bit before it made landfall earlier today. And then now that it's over land, of course, it's going to quickly fall apart, but still have a lot of rainfall associated with it. I did see a report of about seven to nine foot storm surge right when it was making landfall. Anyway, 75 mile per hour winds, some gusts up to 100, moving to the north northeast at 15 miles per hour. 
See, most of the rain along uh, associated with this is all on the north side of it. That's where most of the activity is. Once they get on the back side of the eye, it seems to really taper off quite a bit. The red indicates the hurricane forced winds here now near Alexandria, and this is going to shrink over the next couple of hours as the system weakens, but still a wide swath of tropical storm force winds, of course, associated with that additional rainfall. Yeah, it's actually of course, going to be too much of a good thing for some folks when you get this much rain, but they're, they're going to see more of it stretching all the way to the north and east, right up the Mississippi to Memphis and then eastward. But this red swath here, anywhere from about three to six inches of rainfall on top of what they've already seen around here, zero percent chance all the way through the middle part of next week. I wish I had better news for you, but unfortunately our dry stretch is going to continue. There is a glimmer of hope that we could see a shift in our weather pattern by the end of October, the last week of October, maybe bringing some rain. So cross your fingers. 71 in Lubbock, Abilene 67 here in San Antonio, 77 degrees and a bit humid out there. But tomorrow morning we'll start with some areas of fog in the 60s and then climb well into the 90s and even 100 degrees triple digits south and west of San Antonio. Other than that morning fog, a lot of sunshine tomorrow near a record tomorrow, and I think we'll break a record on Sunday, making it right near 100 degrees for the high, and then we trim temperatures back just a little bit next week. Adam, thank you. Coming up, it was postponed once, but now it's back. Amazon Prime Day, just a few days away, which means huge discounts, but not without some competition this year. Well, it's prime time. Amazon's big shopping palooza that normally is in July was pushed to October. And now other big re retailers are getting in on the action by pretty much moving up Black Friday. 12 on your side's Marilyn Moore. It says calendar confusion aside, the competition for your holiday dollars is about to begin. The countdown is on to Prime Day, which is actually two days beginning Tuesday. Amazon's promising more than one million big discounts on its own products like the Echo and more. We're also going to see a lot of tech deals and a lot of deals on home goods and kitchen appliances and toys especially as well because Amazon is using Prime Day this year to kick off the holiday shopping season. Samantha Gordon, the deal hunting guru for Consumer Reports, says there's a method to the preseason madness. So first of all, the reason that they're doing this is to spread out the, the load of orders so that shipping doesn't get slowed down because of that. We it's easy to get sucked into the hype. So Gordon says ignore the impulse to just click and buy. So it's really good to do your research ahead of time. Figure out what you want and need now. Even put it in your cart and wait for a deal to pop. And of course you want to get the best price. If you use a site like Camel Camel Camel, it will actually research the price history of a product. And check out the competition. Walmart is having its big save event Sunday through Thursday. And coinciding with Prime Day, Target is promoting its deal days. And Best Buy is launching Black Friday on Tuesday, 45 days early. But who's counting? The deals start earlier every year. So I've always said Black Friday starts on November 1st. And this year it starts on Prime Day. Prime Day is only for Prime members. If you don't want to commit the cash, there is a free trial. Marilyn Moritz, KSAT 12 News. More big news from Amazon. The tech company is debuting its first ever electric delivery vehicle. It's all part of Amazon's commitment to be net zero carbon by 2040. 10,000 vehicles are expected to be on the roads within two years and 100,000 before the end of the decade. They'll have state-of-the-art sensor detection and exterior cameras that are connected to a digital display inside of the cab cabin. Amazon says that these vehicles are raising the bar for the future of delivery. Well, one major retailer is looking for employees. Sam's Club has announced a plan to hire 2,000 workers. Officials say they need to increase staff because of the upcoming holiday shopping season. According to a survey of Sam's Club members, 61% plan to do more online shopping in 2020. 31% will be making purchases earlier than usual this year. Well, we have some more bad news for Broadway fans. The pandemic will be shutting down Broadway for at least a full year. 
All 41 Broadway theaters have been closed since March 12th due to the coronavirus pandemic. But today, Broadway suspended all ticket sales for New York performances through May 30th of 2021. Nearly 97,000 workers rely on Broadway for their livelihood and productions have nearly $15 billion worth of impact to the city. The Broadway League says theater goers holding tickets for dates through May 30th, 2021 should contact their point of purchase for details on exchanges and refunds. Still ahead, the unique way a Japanese theme park is getting visitors to return while also helping those still working from home. We'll explain next.